Thank y'all so much. All the way through, the music has been so good today. And didn't the uh, didn't the choir look good this morning? Amen. You know. But I noticed something about the choir as they were singing. There were still a few empty chairs, uh, and I think there are some of you out here and up there that should be up here uh, with the choir. And you may just be waiting on an invitation. Uh, this is your invitation. We'd love to have you in the choir. Uh, it adds so much to our service that you can serve the Lord in that way if you have uh, that gift. If not, we're going to fill those chairs with people like me who can't sing, and it'll go downhill. So uh, please come and, and be a part of that. I want to mention, uh, before I preach this morning, let me just say again, thanks to uh, to Chase. I said something to him about uh, a month or so ago about would you be willing to lead a, a service. And before I could get the words out of my mouth, he said yes. Uh, he was so excited to do that, and I appreciate him so much uh, stepping up. And, and all of those that he was able to enlist uh, to be a part in our regular worship team, and of course our, our choir just adds so much. Thank you so much. And it's not about us and us enjoying, uh, but what it does, it helps us to worship the Lord. Uh, this morning, as we open our hearts, we can, can sense God's presence here and the joy that he gives to us. I've got to mention a couple of things, first of all, before I move into my message this morning. Uh, first of all, uh, this is the first time I've worn this tie uh, to this church. And any time I wear this tie to the church, people who sit in the back or in the balcony after church will come up and say, What was that on your tie? I couldn't tell if you dropped some gravy on it. You know, what? what is it? It's a, uh, it's a baseball mitt with a baseball are you spending, you know, the whole service trying to figure out what was on my tie and not listening to what we had uh, to say? I normally wear it on opening day uh, weekend of, of baseball. This is my tribute to baseball tie. But opening day of baseball was on Easter Sunday, and I just could not bring myself to wear this on Easter Sunday. So you get it, you, you get it today. But that's that's what it is. A couple of important things. I mean, let me mention. Uh, tonight we have our regular scheduled uh, business meeting. We always encourage you to come and be a part uh, of that. But tonight, a couple of things that I uh, would like for you to be aware of that will be taking place that we'll be voting on tonight. One uh, is that we license Caleb to the gospel ministry. Uh, this is an exciting step for him as a church as we see God working in his life, want to affirm that gift in him, and we'll be voting tonight uh, as a church uh, whether or not we sense God's call uh, on his life, if there's evidence of, of that, uh, and we'll be voting to, to license him. And if that goes through, uh, where's Caleb? Oh, he's up there running sound uh, for us. If that goes through, then at some point in the, in the future, we'll, we'll have a portion of a service where uh, we're able to do that. Uh, then also tonight, a very important, and there's other things taking place as well, and they're all important, but some that are out of the ordinary. Tonight, we will have a recommendation from our personnel committee and from your pastor uh, that we hire Colin Perkins, the young man that led our music last Sunday, uh, as our interim uh, minister of music. Uh, and so that will be a recommendation tonight. So that's an important thing that's taking uh, taking place. Shortly thereafter, there's some process in our bylaws that we go through. We will be putting together a, a search committee for a permanent uh, minister of music and also a search committee uh, for a, a youth minister. So be praying about that process and be watching for that in the, in the days ahead. Uh, another thing that's coming up that's so important that I want to give a little time to, um, Mother's Day is coming up. And for some people, and it may be you, Mother's Day, uh, although it's a day of celebration in some ways, can also be a very difficult time. Uh, and there are people that, for whatever reason, have not been able to have children. They want to be a mother, uh, but they can't be. Others that have uh, lost children, uh, maybe perhaps you've lost your mother, other things that make that a, a painful weekend rather than a, a time of, of celebration. And we want that weekend to be a joyful time, everyone to have something to look forward to. And so on the Saturday of, of Mother's Day, you'll notice there's an announcement in your bulletin. We're having a, a tea, an afternoon tea for anyone that would like to participate that falls into that category uh, of folks. So if you need more information about that, call me, call the church office, or, or get in touch with Janet Glaze, who is who is hosting that. And then, and then let me mention this. This is the last thing that I would mention before we move into our sermon. This Friday night is an important time for our deacons. If you're here in a deacon, uh, we're going to be having a deacon fellowship, training, sharing time this Friday night at Cliff Todd's house. I think it's Cliff Todd. It's one of the Todd's. 
uh, house. Uh, but anyway, that information is somewhere, uh, so look, look for that. And, and I haven't done as good of a job as I should getting that word out. So, but that's an important time. I've just continuously been amazed at what our deacons in our church do. They are a great group of men, and they have a servant heart. And every time I turn around, there's something else that they're doing to serve uh, some community within our, in our church family. And that's what deacons are supposed to be doing. So this is going to be a time for me to learn more about what we are doing already in our church as, uh, as a deacon body and how we're serving our church. And also for me to share some thoughts that I have. So be praying for that night. That will be an important time for us. Uh, so we'll meet that this coming Friday night. So make sure you have that on your calendar. All right. All that was things I needed to get out of the way. Uh, As we get ready to move into the the message this morning, let me lead us in a word of prayer uh, together. God, we we just worship you and praise you this morning. We are so thankful that you gift people in ways that uh, they can sing and that they can play instruments and that they can lead us to worship you through through music, even those of us that all we can do is make a, a joyful sound, God. But we thank you for the time that we've had to come into your, your presence this morning. You tell us that your spirit inhabits the praise of your people. So, God, as we have lifted up our praise in all different ways this morning, we know that your presence has been here this morning. And we pray, God, that your spirit would continue to be here and to speak with us in our hearts. God, give us... Uh, the ability to hear with spiritual ears this morning, that your Holy Spirit might direct uh, the message that we need to hear uh, this morning to our hearts. Uh, And God, that it may help us to become more the people individually and also as a church corporately that you have called us to be. So God, we pray and ask all this in your name that we submit ourselves to you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. These last few couple of Sundays we have been talking about our mission, who we are as a church, what our job is, what our purpose is as a church. There's a whole lot of good things that take place in in this world, things that uh, you're involved with, things that you need to be involved with. But we get a phone call, let's say, at the church or somebody walks in the door and they say, here's something we think that you as a church need to be uh, a part of or involved with. How do we decide what it is that we want to do. Is it just a majority votes or uh, is enough people interested in it or if the pastor likes it, we do it? You know, what, what is the directive that we have? What guides us in those things that we're to be involved with uh, as a church? As we look at our calendar and evaluate the, the ministries and the programs that we're planning and laying out before us, what dictates those things that we should be considering in, in that calendar? Well, let me be very, very clear. It's not the preference of the pastor. It's not the preference of the people. But it's what God's word tells us that we're to be and do as, as a church. And that's what we've been looking at as we look at three key verses that we're going to read together in a, in a moment to help us understand who we are and what our purpose is, what our mission is uh, as a church together. Now, how that plays out in, in this congregation in Carthage, Texas, uh, through the, the gifts and the talents and the abilities of the people that God has placed and is continuing to place in this church. Uh, the specific ways that that plays out, then we listen for God. to say, okay, God, how do we do this? But it's going to fit into this framework. And a simple way that we can look at this and understand what our mission is, is that we're to love God, we're to love others, and we're to help others love God. We get this from God's word. There are some key passages that God gives to us uh, in his his word. Jesus was asked, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Then he goes on. He doesn't stop there. Jesus goes on and says, And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. That's known as the great commandments. The great commandments. But there's also a passage that we refer to as the great commission. The last words that Jesus had for his followers before he was ascended uh, into heaven. It says, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So as we look at these verses together, we're able to to put together in a way that we can remember that our mission is to love God, love others, help and help others love God. The first Sunday, two weeks ago, we looked at the idea of loving God. And we were able to, to, to see together that loving God can be expressed in, in two ways. Uh, through worship, like we do here this morning, but also private worship that you have uh, on your own, in your home, in your car, wherever you might be as you worship God. But also discipleship. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So we love God through worship and discipleship. And then last week, we looked at the uh, aspect of loving others. Loving others. This also had two uh, expressions that we considered together. Fellowship. That fellowship being koinonia, that true fellowship of being able to share together and having that uh, relationship of care and trust and working together to accomplish what God has for us in our body, but also service or ministry together. Uh, we love others uh, through making a difference in, in real ways in their life and, and serving them. So that's two of the three. This morning we're going to look at the final aspect of our mission, and that is helping others love God. Once again, we're going to see uh, this expressed in two ways. The first way that we can help others love God is through outreach and evangelism. I see outreach including what we consider to be uh, evangelism. Evangelism is one aspect of the overall outreach that we do as a, as a church. But outreach and evangelism, but also missions. Missions. These are the two ways that, that we express uh, helping others love God as a church. We're going to look at these together. First of all, we're going to think about outreach, outreach as a church. Scripture says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then later on in Acts, it says, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. Don't miss that word. This is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, Gentiles, that you might bring salvation to the ends of the earth. We are to be involved in, in outreach. This is something that uh, sometimes we may neglect as individuals and a, as a church, but there are consequences, consequences beyond dwindling numbers and dwindling budgets. That's not our motivation. Our motivation uh, is to be faithful to what God has called us to be and to be the bearers of that good news. But look at this. Even in the Old Testament, God was about reaching others and sharing the fact that he wants to, to save us, to rescue us from our sins. Look at this passage in Ezekiel. God says, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel. And so hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to a wicked person, you will surely die, and you do not warn them or speak out to dissuade them from their evil ways in order to save their life, that wicked person will die for their sin. But don't listen to this. And I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do, not, if you do warn the wicked person and they do not turn from their wickedness or from their evil ways... They will die for their sin, but you will help save yourself. God holds us accountable. He has given us the assignment to be bearers of his good news, of salvation to, to this world. And we will give an account. You and I will give an account for how we have been faithful to that commission that we have. It's a pretty serious opportunity, a pretty serious assignment that we have to be accountable for that. Let me ask a question. Let me ask a very penetrating question for you this morning. Will there be anybody in heaven because of you? Do we just come to church and say, I'm so thankful that 
some Sunday school teacher or some parent or grandparent or some preacher shared the gospel with me and I'm saved and I'm going to heaven. Now I'm just going to sit back and enjoy and get to sing good music and be around good people. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Or do we take that responsibility to where we understand that there are other people just like us that are lost and dying and going to hell? And that we have the opportunity and the obligation and the privilege to share the good news with them. Will there be anybody in heaven because of you? Ask yourself that question this morning. Helping others love God. Being involved in outreach and evangelism in our church. As we think about outreach, there are basically four types of, of church growth that I want us to think about just briefly this morning. First of all, what I call reclamation. Look around this church. If you look to your left and to your right, if you were to look up in the balcony this morning, you see empty seats. It's my understanding, learning about the history of our church, that this place used to be closer to full than it is now. There are people that, for whatever reason, broke fellowship with, with our church. And many of those people are no longer are, are not connected to anybody's church. Some of them went to another church, and if God led them to do that, that's, that's fine. But there are people who used to be in our Sunday school classes and be a part of our church family that there's broken relationship with. They've chosen to no longer be here. Reclamation is that commitment that we make and that investment we make in that intentional actions that you and I take to seek to redeem those relationships, to reach out to those people that are, should be here with us in the mornings because they're part of our, our family. I challenge each of us in our Sunday school classes to look at our roles and to find those people that should be here and to find some way to reach out to them, let them know that we love them and we more than that, that God loves them and wants them to be a part of the fellowship that's taking place here. How can we reclaim those people that are a part of our family? Scripture tells us that if you come to the altar to give your offering, and there you remember that you have something against someone or someone has something against you, to leave your offering there and go make that relationship right with that brother or that sister in Christ. That's hard sometimes. Sometimes maybe we have done something to, to offend someone or maybe we think, well, I didn't really do anything, but I know that person has something against me. We need to make that effort as children of God. The, the consequences are, are too important. We have to swallow our, our pride. We have to give that intentional effort. Matter of fact, if you're in here and you're in a Sunday school class and you're attending a Sunday school class, there's some 75 people sitting in the sanctuary this morning that weren't in Sunday school this morning. You ought to be saying, hey, guys, we'd love to have you in our class. But you see, it's in these small groups that fellowship can take place. We can't fellowship in this large group right here. It's also in, in these smaller groups where uh, we learn to love one another and we pray for one another and we minister to one another when there's those inevitable bumps of, of life. It's in those small groups that those kind of relationships take place. So you need to be in a small group and, and folks, we need to be reaching out to our friends around us, to those people that are not in this building this morning but that are a part of our family. So reclamation, reclaiming those people uh, that should be here. Let me tell you one story real quickly. Uh, I can give you a name of, of uh, some friends that I had. In one church, we uh, worked to put together a class of people who were no longer attending our church. I just took it upon myself. Uh, we had a fish fry, and I invited all these people that uh, had not uh, been to church in forever that weren't attending anybody else's church. Had a pretty good group show up that night, and we were able to form a class out of that uh, group that came to that, that night. And I was talking to one of the couples uh, that came later after that. They said, "Let me tell you why we're no longer why we stopped coming to church. We we got a time with our with our kids where you know they we were involved in some things that they were doing, and we went on a vacation one week, and and there were just a matter of 
three or four weeks in a row we were out after you know, being very faithful in, in that class. As we were back in town, we, we happened to have a conversation. The lady was telling me, she said, my husband and I, we got to talking about the fact that, you know, we hadn't been to church in a month, and nobody said anything to us. There's not been a call. Y'all okay? Is anybody sick? Did we make you mad? You know? She said, we just realized nobody even said we missed you. And she said, we had an evil thought. She said, let's see how long we can stay away before someone says something. And time passed. Nobody ever said anything, she said, until we got your letter. Folks, that should not be. We have a responsibility when, when people become a part of our family. Part of what they're saying is, I give you permission to minister to me. I give you permission to hold me accountable. We should reach out and care. And we have been, in some instances, negligent in, in that responsibility. That's why some people are not here. And we need to make that right. We need to reclaim some people. There's also biological growth. Oh, we get excited when this happens, and this is a good thing. When someone who is a, a child or a family member of people who are a part of our church, and through coming to Sunday school and the, the, the things that take place in the home, our children and our family members get saved. Oh, that's a wonderful thing, and that should be taking place, and we're excited when that happens. There's also transfer growth. There are people that, for whatever reason, God... They're attending another church in our area, but for some reason God leads them to join uh, our church for some situation. Uh, more common is people that move from another town, and they were part of a, of a church there, and they, they come to our church, and God leads them to, to join our church. That transfer growth. These are all good things that need to take place. But the last area is one I need to really stress, and that's conversion growth. How do we find ways to reach those people in our community who are not attending anybody's church, that they're part of what we call the, the pagan pool, only in that, in that that means that they're, they didn't grow up in a Christian family. They didn't have the benefits that so many of us have. How do we make that effort to cross those barriers, to let them know that we're not just stuck-up people that wear coats and ties and that we think we're better than them, but no, we love them. And that we're on a mission to, to reach them. How do we communicate that? The burden is on us to cross those barriers that are there. How do we reach people here in our community with the good news of the gospel? We have to find those ways with God's leadership. We have to help others love God. Outreach. Outreach. I love the statement that this man made, Dennis Peathers. He says, evangelism is leaving the person I've met with a better understanding of God than they would have if they had never met me. Not all evangelism is going through the Roman road. Not all evangelism do we have to be beating somebody over the head with the Bible. Matter of fact, that's some of the worst evangelism. But to have a conversation with someone and to help someone know that there's a God who loves them, that wants to have a, a relationship with them, to, to share with them how we struggled and how God helps us in our struggles, that we're not insulated from those struggles of life that, that they're facing, that we're right there with them, but that God helps us in those struggles that we face together as people. And how God provides at least some answer and some hope in this world that can sometimes seem so dark leaving the person I met with a better understanding of God than they would have had if they had never met me. Because, see, you and I can't save anybody. It's not our slick tongue or presentation that does it. It's the Holy Spirit at work in that person. We just have to be faithful to share, to engage in conversation, to talk with someone about what God is doing uh, in our lives. And one of the best ways to do that is through our own personal testimony, to share your life before Christ. Here's how I was before I met Christ. Here's how I came to know Christ, and here's how what my life is like since coming to know Christ. Folks, outreach, evangelism is such an important part of who we are as a church, and we can't be negligent in this area if we're going to be faithful to being who God wants us to be. The second area of helping others love God is what I call missions, what we call Missions. Missions is sharing the gospel in word, 
and in deeds with people who will never be a part of our local church. If it's people that we're seeking to reach to be a part of our church here, then that's outreach and evangelism. But folks, God gives us the responsibility to share the gospel with people that will not ever come into our, our church. Maybe because they're in a different location and maybe for any other number of, of reasons. But we're to share the gospel, to be a part of spreading the gospel around the world. Scripture says, again, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That's where they live. We're all to be witnesses here in this area. But it doesn't stop there. But in Judea and Samaria, and the ends of the earth, how are we to share the gospel beyond our area? And again, the Great Commission in one sentence says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. All nations, we are to participate be a part of sharing this gospel around the world, making a difference for the kingdom of God. One of the most famous missionaries of all time, Hudson Taylor, said the Great Commission is not an option to be considered. It's a command to be obeyed. How are we involved in missions individually and as a church? Well, that's a good question. How are we involved? Let me share with you a couple of ways that you can be involved. One is through supporting missions, supporting missions, supporting through prayer and financially. Those that are going, as we think about and have programs and read about our missionaries and missionary endeavors around the world, those things that we're aware of, that we can pray for them, and that is so important, but also to support it uh, financially. Those are things that our church does, and, and often, most often do, we do well. But how do we, how do we do that? One of the best ways we do that is through what we call the cooperative program. Ten percent of every undesignated dollar that comes into our church goes to the cooperative program. It's all Baptists, all Southern Baptists working together to accomplish those things that we can't do on our own. For example, let me tell you what what you and I are supporting. If you're contributing to this church, if you're contributing to this church, which our budget, by the way, for this year is $750,000. So that means it's $75,000, am I right? Goes to the cooperative program. These are things that we're joining with other Southern Baptists to support. And these are just some examples. We support six seminaries, which is helping to train ministers that will be leading in churches now and in, in the future. Uh, we started as Southern Baptists this past year, 732 new churches. We support 3,562 international missionaries, people that are around the world uh, sharing the gospel. We support 5,262 domestic missionaries, people on the North American continent. We help give three, over $3 million to help with the problem of global hunger. We help provide facilities and ministries for, for almost 9,000 children who for some reason are, are in Baptist-supported residential care. We support disaster relief projects all around the world. We support Baptist hospitals, seven of which are in Texas. We support 860 Baptist collegiate ministries like BSMs. We have one here, Panola, at Panola, BSM there. This past year, 10,000, over 10,000 college students made professions of faith through our Baptist college ministries. And that is so important. These are students that are preparing to be leaders, many of them international students, but other people that are preparing to go back to their communities and be community leaders and leaders in business, but they're, get, they're be, getting saved as they're there at college as a result of the support that we're, we're providing. Those are things that we support through the cooperative program, that 10% that our church gives, but direct support in our church. There's things that we support directly. Mission Carthage here in our area, the Africa Anchor, Anchor of Hope, a children's home and ministry orphanage there in Africa, the House of Disciples here in our area, the Texas Baptist men, primarily uh, disaster relief kinds of work, the Panola College, BSM. We give also to ETBU and to Baylor, our Baptist universities here in our area that are helping train leaders, not just ministers, but all leaders to be Christian leaders in their chosen fields uh, of work. You and I are supporting missions in that way. 
Um, and that's a good thing. But in addition to supporting missions, we need to be involved in missions personally. We need to participate in missions. How do you do that? Short-term trips. Our, our church will be organizing short-term mission trips, maybe construction, maybe a VBS. Who knows what it will be as God leads. We'll do some short-term mission trips, partnering with ministries that are taking place uh, to have ongoing kinds of uh, support and participation with groups. Planning a church, one of my desires, one of the things that God is putting on my heart already as a church is that just like a, a Sunday school class starts a, a new class that as a church that we would start another new church somewhere that needs a church that doesn't have a church and that we would have a direct hand in starting that church and helping it get started. But then also short-term and long-term career missionaries. God is calling some of you as missionaries. And oftentimes we think it's the young people. And that is certainly the, the case. God calls so many young people to be missionaries. But there are ways that any of us can be involved in short-term and long-term missions. Let me tell you a couple of things uh, about short-term missions. If you're, let's say, an English teacher, there are places in this world that you can't say, hey, I'm a missionary and I want to come in your country. It's close to that. But they're begging for English teachers to come. You can go in and be an English teacher, and, and while you're there, God can use you to build relationships with people and to be a missionary uh, in, in that way. Other fields as well can do the, the same thing. I had a friend named John McAllister, one church that we served. He was a, he was a construction guy. He was real good with his hands, um, did all kind of construction things. On his retirement, they gave two years of their life with, with what's called Mission Service Corps. Uh, weren't paid, they were retired, but they went into a missions area, and what they did is organized groups that were coming in to do mission trips, construction mission trips. He had the knowledge needed, and he would help identify projects uh, in their area, things that needed to get done, and churches would call and say, hey, we've got a group that wants to come, what do you need? And he'd say, well, we have a church that needs a roof on it, or we have a church that needs some painting done, or whatever the needs may be, and he would organize those groups to help meet the, the needs in, in their area. God can use your giftedness, whatever gifts you have. If you have the time and the ability to go, even in your retirement, there are ways that you can help be a, make a difference for the kingdom of God and be a short-term missionary. But I also believe God is calling some to be vocational, lifelong missionaries out of our church. So we'll be praying about that as well. Missions. Missions. Being a part of what God has called us to do as a church. Our mission, love God, love others, help others love God. As we're thinking about outreach and evangelism and missions today, let me make something very clear as we're moving toward a time of response this morning. You don't hire your pastor and staff to do out all the outreach and evangelism for the church. That's not our job. We have the same responsibility that you do to be involved in that. But God calls all of us to be in part of outreach and evangelism. Our job is to equip you, to help you be able to do what God has called you to do in reaching those people that God brings across your path. This morning as we have a time of response, what question should we be asking ourselves this morning. God, what would you have me do in this time of response this morning? Perhaps you're here this morning and as, as we walk through these topics of outreach, evangelism and, and, and missions, perhaps you have sensed in your heart this morning I've not been doing anything. I have been disobedient to the Lord in this area. Perhaps this morning what you need to do is confess to God, God forgive me, forgive me for not being faithful, being obedient to what you have called me to do in reaching out to others. To come and pray and say, God, open my eyes to the opportunities that you are placing before me. Give me courage to, to begin a conversation. And God, give me favor in the mind and the heart of the person that I'll be talking to. Commit yourself this morning to every morning as part of your prayer time to say, God, today, today, use me in some way, to reach someone, at least to move them further down the pathway of, of knowing you. Perhaps it's just inviting someone to church, but perhaps it's sharing a little bit of your personal story. God, use me today 
for your kingdom's purposes in some way today and commit to do that. Perhaps there's someone here today that you're sensing a call to missions vocationally or there's some other way that you're sensing God is willing to use your giftedness and your abilities uh, for his kingdom's sake. Come and pray. Commit that to the Lord. Share that with us and we'll help you uh, think through that and how we can do that. This morning there are ways that God is wanting you to respond. Perhaps it's there where you'll be standing, but perhaps it's to come and kneel in prayer, have one of the staff pray with you this morning. Whatever it might be that God would have you to do, this will be your opportunity to respond. As a church, as we seek to become all that God has called us to be. Let's stand together as we pray. Father, thank you for the salvation that we have. The salvation that we enjoy that gives us such confidence and hope and joy in our lives. We thank you for those people, God, that you use to make a difference in our lives. For Father, don't let the chain stop at us. Father, help us to be faithful to taking note of those opportunities that you give us to be your witnesses, to encourage others and to share with others the, the love that you have for them and the way that they too can be saved. God, forgive me. Forgive me for the times that I was too afraid or too busy or too preoccupied, whatever it might be, God, that I didn't take the opportunity that you placed before me to share the good news with someone, God, that your spirit might then work in their life. Father, open my eyes, open our eyes to the opportunities that you'll give us today to share a word in some way, God, to be a light, to make a difference eternally. Father, that there will be people in heaven, that there will be people in heaven because of us allowing you to use us to share a word or to do a deed. Break our hearts, God, for the people around us and our families that we work with, we go to school with, that we play with, that are that just come across our path, God, those divine appointments, God. Break our hearts as we see them the way that you see them, people that you love, people that you love, and people that you love so much that you died for. God, help us to care enough that we would reach out and take that risk. So, God, we just submit this time to you. Whatever the... The decisions are whether it's someone that's here today, God, that just needs to accept you for the first time and your spirit's working in their life. Other decisions that need to be made, God, this is our time that we allow your spirit to work in our lives and we respond, God, ever, ever how you lead us. So we submit this time to you, God, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You respond how God leads this morning.